What'd you eat for dinner tonight? Chicken nuggets. Chicken nuggets? Are you lying? Pizza. But was there chicken on the pizza? Look at the two. You gonna sit there? Yeah. You wanna sing songs? You wanna sing songs? Yeah. What's your favorite song? Happy birthday, please. Do you know Respect by Aretha Franklin? Yep. Do you know who Queen Latifah is? Rosa Parks? Yeah. You know who Rosa Parks is? I'm feeling really great about this. Uh, how do you feel? Look one happy. Are you ready for bed? Yeah. Wait. You ready for bed? No. <laughs> you ready? Let's get it. That's how you feel. Absolutely not. That's, <laughs> oh, boy. Oh. Hey, folks. Welcome back to another episode of That's How You Feel. Thanks for tuning in. This is episode four. Uh, we are back with our, another segment of mental health, wellness, and therapy. I am your host, Caleb. And I'm your other host, Levi. And today we want to welcome back Mr. Chris Foreman, who thank happens you, to you. be Chris, Chris's brother. No, he's my, he's Chris, my brother. Is, Chris is Chris's brother. Yes. <laughs> hey, this is week two. We've been here for seven days straight. We have not left. I'm in the same shirt. I haven't showered, but we're going to get right into it. We had a hot episode last week. I think, yeah, I was, I was really happy with it. I, I think learned, the viewers loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Those two viewers and Cody Rhodes. If you loved it, put some comments in the comment section. Yeah. Please. Yeah. We yeah, didn't say that last time. Likes. Comments and likes. Because we're going to start reading those. Eventually, you know, if y'all actually watch it, we'd like to know. So also give us some feedback. If there's a certain topic that you want to hear on the show, let us know. We would love to talk about it, discuss this, discuss it. I can't speak today. It's discuss it um or even you know um have another guest on the show and you know be able to have an open forum like this because i think this has been really beneficial um to have you especially with your knowledge um just from your business um in the health and wellness so yeah so I what do we want to start that. with today caleb uh so last week we talked a lot about therapy and different therapy techniques therapy approaches a lot of things like that uh you shared a lot about your your own journey with your own company, Wellness District, and how or why it means so much to you, and why you're what makes you so passionate about it. Um, I will. I'd want to ask you uh, in 2024. One, how long have you been in, been in the space, and what what's got you pumped for this upcoming year, mm. and just like you know the future of Wellness District? Like, what's got you excited? That's a good question. Um, wow. So. I have been in business for five years going into my sixth year nice. and, and to Congrats. be still operating. I think to me, that's a huge success. Yeah. You know, we're, we're not wildly successful, but you know, a lot of businesses fail within the first two to three years. And so I've done a lot of um, soul searching to see like, wow, this is really hard. Do I want to keep going? Mm -hmm. And the answer is a resounding. Yes. This is something I'm very passionate about and something that I'm excited for this year is Hopefully we can nail down some great partnerships and contracts with some major players in the industry. Um, what we're looking at doing is eventually starting something like a wellness festival. A oh, lot nice. of people are doing, um, they're, they're going to the Coachellas, they're going to, you know, all of these different festivals and ultimately they're just going to numb themselves and, you know, oh, I don't remember much of the experience or I want to go see my favorite band, but you know, we're, doing all kinds of substances and whatnot. And, but they're looking and searching for something. And so if we can mm -hmm. find a way to provide a high quality, amazing, entertaining experience, but have wellness be the focus of that, or at least have wellness be a large part of how they experience fun. Um, in the past year, I have been working with people who have been trying to break addictions. Um, maybe they've come from sober living or they've, they're in recovery and that type of environment and scene would be very triggering to them. So like, well, where are the, the places that we can go to have fun yeah. and experience some great art and artistry, but not be, you know, be bombarded with all of the, you know, the drugs and the alcohol and the things that they may not want to in, indulge in. And so I'm excited to start building that part of um, the business out. And in the past, I would say year and a half or so, I've had the chance to work with some, some great um, celebrities, maybe you know, maybe expanding that part of the business. You know Adele? I don't know Adele, but if Adele, if you're listening, I would love to work with you. <laughs> Do you love Adele? Man. Adele's going, I can imagine Adele well, watching this on the phone right now and going, 
Listen, <laughs> swipe. I could talk about talk. Adele. I happened. I went to Vegas back in September, and I got to see her show. She's incredible. Um, so if you're watching this, we, just do us a favor and just tag Adele in the comments somehow, and that'll just yes. And then we can get her a part of the I that festival. That's actually a really good idea, and I think thank you. Um, there's there's not things like that. Yeah, you know you not. you mentioned like even so. I mean, I remember I'm, this just popped in my head. Years ago, I went with Joel and Cassie to Chipotle Fest. Oh, okay. um, Chipotle had put on a festival, but <laughs> I know it was a bunch of food, but it also it was like local bands and there were a lot of substances you could see people doing in the crowd. So, I mean, to have a space like that is really cool. So I'm really cool to see like that come to life in fruition. Just, I'm really excited for you. You're really that. cool to see. Did I say <laughs> that? That's what you said. Yeah, well, it is cool to, to see. Either way. It's really cool to see. Anyways. I'm making fun of him. Let me live. (laughs) Well, I'm putting it out there. So it's going to happen. No, I'm excited. I did want to ask. So what year did you start your company? 2018. 2018. So just because, I mean, we've lived the last three years of it. What was it like during the pandemic with your business? Like, did that, um, I mean, it may have helped your business. I mean, because I know that there's been a lot of mental health through the pandemic as well. Mm. Um, and wellness. Cause I know we're mm-hmm. going to touch a little bit more on wellness on this, um, episode, but I'm just interested to hear how the pandemic affected. No, the pandemic, um, helped us indirectly. It hurt us directly. I mean, obviously people weren't going to the yoga studios and gyms were closed and they weren't, we had to move everything to zoom and people were kind of iffy of like, how do I do healing sessions over zoom? Can I do this type of therapy over zoom? How do I do? Re-? There were people that said, Hey, I can do Reiki over zoom. I'm like, how is that even possible? Yeah. Um, but people still continue their, their work and people actually, you know what? Some people didn't survive. Some practitioners mm. didn't make it through the pandemic because it was hard for them to continue the work that they do. Yeah. Um, but what it did do is it, br- it brought such an awareness to corporations and businesses about the importance of mental health, the importance of wellness. And now you see a lot of corporations implementing wellness programs mm-hmm. as part of their employee benefits package. And that's where it's exciting for me to come alongside and say, hey, you know, if you're looking for these types of modalities or these types of healing uh, methods for your employees and your staff, then we can help you find those um, people. And we can almost act as, like I said, an agency that connects people to the right resources for their employees and staff. Nice. Nice. Sorry, that just popped in my head and I was curious about that. So Um, something that I was curious on last episode, you had talked about how uh, certain like behavioral disorders, certain like mental um, issues that people have uh, could be traced back to just simple things like nutrition and just Mm -hmm. what kind of food are people ingesting that is causing them to behave certain ways. Um, What I would like to know is in, in your line of work and the things that you've experienced, Um, could you, one, could you elaborate on that? And could you just, I mean, how can someone that again, like they're, they're new to this, maybe they're, they have a child that's got like, you know, some anxiety, some, some high functioning, maybe some, even some ADHD. I got a friend of mine, uh, both of her kids have autism. She has, she has two twin boys that have autism. Um, and she has made great strides and just changing their diet to help mm-hmm. with the autism. Like it's not like they didn't cure it, but like, you know, they're not as like hyperactive as they would be on like a heavily processed food diet. So is there like, how can someone start to take a look at that and go, okay, what kind of changes can they make immediately mm-hmm. just to see if nutrition might be a factor. I mean, immediately stop with the pop tarts. Like, <laughs> <laughs> listen, I thought you were going to McDonald's and no, fast food, no. so that's fine. Hey, with me. Before he says anything, <laughs> he ate a box of chicken nuggets out my fridge mm. this morning. Hey. <laughs> so that could have been organic. Take whatever you say, whatever he said <laughs> with a grain of salt. Chicken nuggets. <laughs> he ate chicken nuggets from McDonald's this morning. So no, you know, go on. I, I was saying that to be funny, but in in you know. In all seriousness, there is a link, a direct link to the types of food that you feed kids for breakfast and how they behave throughout Mm. the school day and their ability to focus. And what we have been taught was like, hey, a bowl of cereals is going to be fine for breakfast. Like we grew up eating the Captain Crunch and the Cinnamon Toast Crunch Praise when, God. when we when we could afford it. You know, <laughs> the off brand stuff. Was, <laughs> <laughs> I knew that would make him laugh. Um, peanut Butter Crunch. Gosh. Shout out to peanut, peanut butter, butter crunch. cup and crunch. That's that's yes. where it's oh at. My goodness. Um, oh. Stay focused, man. Come Listen, on. Listen, I'm about to go to the store and get me a bowl. 
<laughs> and so we we grew up thinking like, okay, I our parents said I gave you food, I gave you breakfast, that was nutrients. But mm-hmm. then not understanding the cycle of the brain and how the sugar in that in that cereal can actually cause your brain to have a similar to a similar response to a cocaine addiction, right? Mm-hmm. It's just like it's that powerful what the wow. sugar does, and there's so much sugar in these breakfast cereals and breakfast foods. Um, and then, so what is that doing to you, your child while they're trying to focus, take a test and they, they, they really can't. Some people have um, a higher disposition or an intolerance to that level of sugar. Same thing with gluten, carbs, you know, whatever. I think the most important thing you can do is ask um, yourself like, Hey, what am I doing to fuel myself for success? And then are there things that I can switch out in order for me to have a better successful um day with my nutrition because how you start the day does matter if you start off eating you know the bagel or the sugary cereal or whatnot then it's going to be very difficult for you to like then switch over to eating a salad at lunchtime or eating something nutritious for dinner you just kind of snowball what you did in the morning to the rest of the day it's like well i might as well indulge right yeah mm. no i actually it's funny you said that i had a coworker who just i think last week posted about this she for 30 days straight ate, I think it was a cup of cottage cheese for breakfast, mm. which I know that seems weird a cottage, cottage cheese for breakfast, but mm-hmm. she, she wrote this post on Facebook and she was talking about all the benefits that she's seen just from that and how she felt more energetic throughout the day. Um, and so now I've thought about going out and my mornings for me, I'm not a morning person, so I don't like to wake up early, but get up out of the door. And a lot of times it could be fast food, grab mm-hmm. something at the house. Um, and so I'm like, maybe I should get caught. That's a simple, you know, simple fix. You want to find a simple fix, obviously, for right. your lifestyle. Right. And it has to be sustainable. Yeah. Something that you can repeat time and time again. And if you build that habit in for several weeks, then you're like, wow, I've made a, a major change. And, and what I was um, talking about earlier and kind of what you said, elaborate on the gut brain health connection is that sometimes when you eat certain foods, they have what's called mirror neurons and that are in the brain that are also in the gut. And so immediately, sometimes you can almost feel that you've eaten something that's not good for you. Like mm-hmm. you might start getting bubble guts like right away. As soon as you like swallow it, you might be like, Mm, I don't know if that's going to work out. <laughs> for I don't me. know about that. <laughs> so there's this thing called intuitive eating that some integrative therapists or different nutritionists or dietitians started to practice intuitive eating. What is it? How do you feel after you eat this? And then documenting that time and time again, and then looking at those results and saying, Hey, you know, what? every time I've eaten that bag of chips, like I didn't feel great. And I actually, you know, gotten an argument with my spouse or actually yelled at my kid or I was irritable or, or whatnot. And so mm. it's just bringing that consciousness and awareness to your diet. I think that goes a long way. And then you can start to dial in some of the things you need to, to take in and out and yeah. replace, but it's a process and it's not easy. I love food. I'm not the most healthy eater. I absolutely love food, but I'm like, look, I'm going to work out and earn <laughs> what I'm going to eat today. Well, and that brings up a good point. Cause I know um, for me, I'm a foodie as well. I can talk about food all day long. Bread, cheese, cards. Mm-hmm. I'm there. Um, and I know which, which I got nothing I'm to say. I'm, I'm, just, I'm sitting here. Um, I know sugar is, it's kind of like you said, it's like cocaine essentially. Yeah. Um, so getting off of that, coming off of that, um, I, I don't know that there's an answer to this, but how do you sustainably, yeah. and I guess you kind of probably already said it, you know, finding those foods that make, you know, make you, but, I'll take this one, Chris. Um, no. Nah. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, Caleb, Caleb has done a, an amazing job of cutting yeah. back on whatever he was eating before. He's not yeah. eating the, the high sugar content foods. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, no, I, I, it has nothing to do. I, well, I guess like my weight loss has had, has to do with wellness overall. Yeah. But you know, the changes that I made were like to go from where, how I normally was eating and then to actually look at what I eat now for overall health and just like weight loss, um, one, I was eating an incredible amount of processed foods and I was eating an incredible amount of fast food and just over the overconsumption of just unhealthy fats and carbs. And, but I would kid myself and thinking, well, you know, I took the stairs today. So that, <laughs> that makes up for the sausage McGriddle at the that back I'm having. of the parking lot. No, I'm not parking in the back of nowhere, <laughs> but, uh, but no, like, so to, to think about the kind of foods that I used to eat and the kind of foods that I eat now, 
Um, I try to eat just as many whole like foods as I can, like as the least amount of processing of food can go through. Like I eat a lot of like raw fruits and veggies. I eat a lot of like chicken, eggs, or I'm sorry, egg whites, um, just to try to just limit the amount of food that's like naturally occurring in the wild, like fruits and vegetables. Um, and then just like kind of like chicken and, you know, fish and steak or whatever. But it was, I mean, it's incredibly difficult. And I still like, I had a little bit of chocolate earlier. Like I still will give myself like treats or whatever, but you know, like the first weeks to months of changing was so hard because it was just like, it was this mental shift but also, like it, t- it took a while because I I, I kind of weaned myself off where I was like, all right, I'm gonna eat this instead of this, and then I was just trying to figure out like healthy swaps. Um, I don't know. That's kind of how I did it. But you know, it. But I think also, everybody's eating journey is different. Eating is incredibly emotional. Oh yeah, it's incredibly emotional. I mean, think about how you feel when you get to eat your favorite food and your snack and what that does for you. The the the. <laughs> the dopamine release and Sorry, the, what about your brain is going the through. The I had the other and, day. Oh, shut up. <laughs> and that swing of like having having an appetite for what it is that you desire. I, I learned this about um, our dad, right? He's I've learned that he's an emotional eater. As, as mm-hmm. much as he would want to eat healthy, it's what soothes him to eat whatever he, because that to him is the only thing that he can control in his life because he's older. He doesn't have a lot of mobility, but at least this will make me happy. And I think a lot of people have to start to connect what they eat to how they feel, not just because of how they feel physically, but how are they feeling emotionally? And if that thing were to be taken away from you, how does that make you feel? It's like, Oh, maybe I have an unhealthy attachment to this thing. And the fact that they also do put things that are addictive in the food, especially yeah. processed food. So breaking that addiction, breaking that cycle is something that requires um, strict discipline, but also maybe even a conversation with a the therapist. Yeah. Right. I used to eat out of just complete boredom. Like I remember. Yeah, I like, still do. The, yeah. Like the, the routine, like, and it started when I was in school, like I would literally come home from school and I don't even think I had my backpack off and I would walk to the fridge to get something to eat. And it's, it's such an ingrained habit, like coming home from the grocery store, coming home from any place, the gas station, I immediately like this, the habit is I'm, I'm 30 years old now. The habit is still to go straight to the fridge. You're 30. I'm whatever. Uh, the habit. Did we go over this last episode? Yeah. Wait a second. (laughs) Can we move? Like, first of all, both of y'all knew what y'all whole heart, what I meant. (laughs) The, the the habit of just like out of boredom, like the fridge is there, like oh, I ain't got nothing else to do. Might as well eat something like that's literally the thought. And I have to catch myself because my diet now is so like you can't tell, but my diet is like so like kind of honed in that like I only am allowed a lot of like I allot myself a certain amount of calories and meals a day. So the urge is to just go eat because I ain't got nothing else to do. And like, I will say, don't discredit yourself, Caleb, because I'm just saying, I know like all of, all of the viewers we got haven't seen all your journey, but um, you have seriously been very strict with this and have seen a lot of success. And so um, since we're on the subject of wellness, how would you say the diet change or, you know, the change of lifestyle. Cause a lot of times when you hear diet, you're, you know, I feel like that mm-hmm. just throws you out. Right. Mm-hmm. And I do, I, I try to say no lifestyle change because, yeah. you know, I feel like it's a better way. And that may just be me. But that may just be how I feel. But, um, from you personally changing your diet, mm-hmm. um, besides losing weight, you know, and stuff, feeling healthier, like what have you noticed from it? I've noticed the, the biggest thing for me is, like how aware I am and how awake I am during the day now. So before when I was literally eating whatever I wanted to, um, the meals were exciting. You know, I, I would, I'm, I'm going to five guys tonight or I get to go to McDonald's for like, you know, the McGriddle or, you know, the meals that I would make for myself at home. Those were the exciting moments of the day, but I'm lethargic and low energy everywhere else in the day. And it's, I mean, coffee, sugar-free energy drinks to try to keep myself up during those between the meal times because I have so much no energy, you know, in between the meals. And now it's completely reversed where meals 
uh, let's be honest like they're, they're not as exciting anymore because they're not as like processed and there's no like those added flavors that corporations put into food uh food is kind of boring now but the time in between meals now i'm wide awake you know I, like and especially if you want to look at just quality of sleep i sleep a lot better i don't sleep enough still and that's so it's so 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 important to get a good amount of sleep at night because you know if your, your sleep affects a lot of things too i think chris we're gonna i'm a, a matter of fact you're going there next to sleep mm. um but just overall the diet and the lifestyle changes like you know i wake up every morning and i try to work out and then i, I eat very nutrition nutritionally dense food so that my day is so much better because of that because of that shift before I was lethargic all day. You know, I would literally eat a meal like a like a fast food burger and I could go immediately to sleep. Now I eat a meal and I'm wide awake for, you know, the day. So it's yeah. it's yeah, the energy, food, the, food the energy is shift to, is, is huge. Food is supposed to fuel you for the work ahead. So. Yeah. yeah. So how does one find a balance? Sometimes, you know, like you said, it may be going to a therapist, nutritionist. Mm -hmm. But so for me personally, I, you know, I'm married. Me and my wife both work full time jobs. We have two kids who are toddlers. And so they run our lives. Yeah. And so by the time we get to their bedtime, we are already beaten, exhausted. And half the time, that's when we get a chance to eat, um, which we have now adapted to, you know, cooking a meal for everyone so that we mm -hmm. all eat the same thing. Um, and obviously I know it's, you know, choose healthier options, you know, when you're shopping, like, you know, look at the healthier stuff, but I feel like a lot of times when people hear diet or you need a, a lifestyle change in your food, like it kind of throws them away um, because you have many diet programs out there mm -hmm. that you could either run to or go for. Um, but how, what steps can you make to start? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, um, if you wanted to talk to a dietitian or a nutritionist, I think that's a great start because even somebody might be able to come to your pantry and just like, look at your pantry and he's like, this, this, this needs to go replace it with this, this, and this. They're going to clean out my whole pantry. Somebody, I mean, <laughs> sometimes that's what it takes because ultimately we're still going to go for what, like the low hanging fruit. We're going to go for the thing that's really accessible. I'm hungry now. I don't have a lot of time and I need, I need to fuel my body with something. Otherwise it's going to be a problem yeah. for everybody. Which is why fast food has become so popular. Exactly. And so thinking about ways that you can get whole nutritious meals. I like shakes. Um, one of my favorite companies, Kachava makes amazing shakes. Um, I'm hoping to get sponsored by them. Kachava. So Kachava. Is, that, Kachava. is that based out of California? I don't know where it's based out no, of. I've heard of them. They have an infomercial. So is it like <laughs> one no that, infomercial. Do they send it, they send it to your house? I've seen their commercial. Do they like, send it to your house? Yeah, yeah. You oh, can get okay. So it's not like a yeah. storefront. It's no, like, no, okay. No, no, no. no. Okay, no, Kachava. It's, it's just a whole meal. You can shake it up with water or milk or put whatever you want in it. But it has basically all of the nutritional things that you need. Did you bring and some? It, actually, I did not because I, I was going to try your protein powder see how that oh. makes me feel. So it better be good. But something Maybe like that like can it. is easily accessible. I know I'm getting the nutrients that I need. I don't have to reach for the, you know, to the candy bar. And you have to be careful with the granola bars, too. Some of them ah. don't, they, you know, they look and say they're nutritious, but Nature Valley, no? <laughs> well, and that, I mean, that's a good point because, you know, well, first off, good job. So do you start, let me, because I don't want to skip over this. Good job. Do you start your day with that typically? After a workout. Okay. Yeah. And, and the reason I love that, immediate thing after the workout is because I know that my body needs it. I'm like, I just put my body through something. It needs fuel. And this is something that I can easily um, make takes two seconds. And then I'm feeling better. I'm, I'm calm. And from that, I can make better decisions about what I'm going to eat the rest of the day. Not to get in your personal life. So do you wake up, work out then? Okay. Yeah. Good job. Okay. Yeah. So do I. I know, but I still don't understand it, man. I'm trying to <laughs> listen. I got insomnia. I'm trying. We're, we're gonna no, be talking it, about sleep. It, it, but, but like even with with the diet or the lifestyle change with nutrition, exercise, it takes. Um, I'll be the first to say it takes an incredible amount of discipline to keep it up. But the systems that I have in place help me remain consistent. Like I meal prep a lot. Like there's, mm -hmm. I, like, I do a lot of that. Like. I try, my wife's going to say I'm a liar, but I try to get off my phone <laughs> by a certain time. That way I can actually wind down. Like I have a blue light blocker on my screen uh, that turns on automatically at like eight o'clock so that, so that the blue light is 
you know, removed from my eyes. So my brain doesn't think, you know, we need to be awake. Like my, it it allows me to shut down. So hopefully I don't like, I still get in bed and still scroll. It's a horrible habit, but the blue light's gone. You know, I try to eat what I eat, but like the systems that I have in place make it a lot more convenient for me to stick to it. Like the diet's only going to work if you can stick to it, it's, yeah. it's got to, it's, it's one, it's got to be incredibly easy. It's got to be incredibly simple. Otherwise it's just, it's just going to be a, it's, it's going to be more of a hassle than it is, you know, to help you. So, um, but yeah, like that's well, what I, I was going to about it. Easy is a key point because I think a lot of people, I was talking about busy lifestyles. You're wanting to find any, a quick, easy, everyone quick, easy fix. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I want to do it now. Like I need, I need to do it easy. Um, and when, I think of like diets or changing my lifestyle food. For me, it's just, it doesn't seem like an easy fix, mm-hmm. um, which maybe that's just meaning to change my mind. My that's how you feel about it though. Yeah. <laughs> but, but maybe I can be, like I said, I could be wrong. I need to change, you know, change mm-hmm. myself. And so obviously it does take willpower, um, you know, and you have to be hold into it. You can't just go two days into it and be like, nah, that now I can have my cheat day, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think there's something to be said about willpower versus subconscious programming and and I can go for hours about, you know, the subconscious programming that we all have had growing up and then also the things that are instilled in us on a day-to-day basis. It is it's hard because we we live in a society that rewards you for doing the the quick and easy. And the reward mm-hmm. for doing something that takes a long time and that's difficult is it's so much longer to be able to see that reward. And so that's why we give up on a lot of things whether it's entrepreneurship, whether it's relationships, whether it's anything, we're so used to the instant gratification of something. I'm not going to finish this because I'm not seeing the reward. Yeah. But how long, how long does it take to, you know, see the results you want to see for as far as improving your mental health, your sleep and your diet, it takes time. And that's why, you know, at, at our company, we focus on working in the journey with these people and letting them know, like, look, this is going to take time, but the benefits you will see. And then we also show them the benefits with, we have them wear a sleep tracker. We track their nutrition. We track their blood work. We track all of these things so that they can see like, wow, this is actually helping me versus, oh, I don't know if I feel better. Cause frankly, you can tell me you feel better, but right. I, I probably don't believe you. I actually want to see the data. Yeah. Because people, <laughs> well, and people can cover it up really yeah, easy. You can you lie. Know? You can cover it up. Oh yeah. Yeah. Just like with mental health, you know, people, oftentimes we'll say, you know, Oh, I'm good. I'm good. And people believe him because, you know, on the front, you look good, but you don't know what someone's carrying or, you know, holding on the inside. Right. And, and some of the ways that we, we can see that is um, looking at some biometrics like your HRV heart rate variability. A lot of the sleep trackers track that now because it's an indication of um, the milliseconds between each heartbeat, which is an indication of your, of your body's ability to adapt to stress. And the higher the number, the more you are able to adapt to stressful situations, which is probably an indicator of like your ability to sleep and your circadian rhythm. So all of these things kind of feed into one another. But it's um, fascinating to see somebody's numbers change. It's like, wow, we changed this thing in your diet and we saw this number go up. Oh, we changed this thing in your behavior. You worked out in the morning instead of the evenings. So that means are you more consistent? Now we yeah. see your sleep improving this way. Um and I think wellness is, it's going to be an individual journey for everybody, Yeah. but you have to start somewhere and track how that behavior is affecting you. Otherwise you actually will give up and you won't identify the thing that actually helped you. Yeah. Do you think that, um, if someone is like, you know, beginning the journey, do you think that they need to have a goal in mind? Do you, do you think they need to be able to like envision the finish line, um, ahead of time or let's just, you know, it, or is it just more important? Let's just get on the journey and just let's, let's just start pedaling. Because I, I think it might be scary to kind of drive with, with no direction in mind, drive with no destination in mind. I think it's different for everybody because not everybody's starting at the same starting line. Somebody who's dealing with anxiety or depression, to, to ask them to think about a goal might actually feel very overwhelming and mm-hmm. defeating. They, yeah, okay. They're not going to be like, yeah, I'm excited about that. It's like getting out of bed today was hard. How about mm-hmm. we start there? brushing my teeth and doing this thing. I I had a client that was in that severe state where he was going to give up his business. He was not talking to his family and friends and every day was a struggle for him. So I wasn't like, Hey, we're going to six months to have you ride as rain. It was like, this is going to be a journey. 
And how about for today, you just show up here on this Zoom call or show up here at this office appointment. Great. How do you feel? Tell me about where you're at now. Okay. Let's, can we repeat that tomorrow? Yeah. Um, if you are somebody who overthinks things, that might not be a good idea for you to try to make a goal because <laughs> you're like, well, if, if, if I make it this, then I'm going to be mad at myself if I, if I don't meet it. And then, mm. you know, whatever the, the overthinkers, they're going to think too long about doing a goal. So yeah, they might just need to start for somebody who needs to see the rewards sooner than it is probably good for them to see a goal. Like you want to lose 10 pounds by this date. Okay. Let's set that up for three, four weeks from now. That might be a good idea. So everybody's different. Everybody's brain is wired different. Yeah, I've seen enough brain maps to know we're not all playing by the same rules. We're not all playing with the same tools. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, I am in no way going to prescribe anything right, for, yeah. for anyone without at least understanding how they operate. Um, Looking at, okay. No, knowing that everybody kind of operates differently. I, I personally feel like, my mental health is good. Uh, it was brought into question when I had my dad move in with me for a while. I, boy, I tanked real quick. Uh, but for someone like, like I feel like I, I have pretty good mental health, but I have a hard time having empathy for friends of mine that struggle with mental health, with struggle with anxiety, struggle with depression. You know, they just, they feel so much and I have a hard time um, empathizing with them. And I just, I don't know how to do it. Uh, how, how could you help me sort of be a better ally to them, a better friend for them? Um, when they, when they want to like come to me and just talk to me and just get things, vent, you know, be a sounding board. I don't like, I want to be a better friend. I want to be a better help to them, but I just sometimes don't know how to I don't know how to relate to that because I'm just like, I'm do you want the easy answer? Or you want the hard answer? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the easy answer is, is practice. Um, mm -hmm. When you ask God to give me more patience, he's going to give you opportunities to be patient. Mm -hmm. The hard answer is it's likely that you're still wounded. And me? It, yes. Because I don't empathize with them. <laughs> It's it's hard for wounded people to empathize with other wounded people because there's still there's still a need for you to feel safe and secure and whole. Hmm. And, and you're real defensive on that, by the way. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm 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 not I'm not trying to be. I'm just like I'm, I'm just kidding. I I no. I mean, it, I'm just well, trying to. Like, huh. It's 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 yeah, the I'm, empathy is the ability to um, hold space. In, in the midst of somebody else's vulnerability. And it's like, I'm going to hold this space for you and it's going to be okay. I can probably relate to some of the things that you're feeling, but I'm not in those things. When you're in those things and, or those things are still in your body somewhere, then it doesn't feel comfortable. It feels like, ugh. Like, I, I like can't you haven't been able to work through that. Right. I can't hold space for you because I need to hold space for myself. And those two things, we, we can't do that at the same time. Yeah. Do you think that might be like, you know how there's some people that like try to like, will make a joke in a tense situation and try to like lighten the mood. Yeah. Is that, is, is that kind of like what you might, what, what you're kind of touching on? Like, cause if something, if I, I think if I feel uncomfortable with something, I, I always, I think I try to make a joke about something just to kind of lighten the mood and get the, let's lighten the tension here real quick. I don't know. Well, that's a, it's a deflective um, deflection technique where in order to avoid vulnerability, then mm -hmm. we divert attention to something else. Right. And, and which can be appropriate in some cases, right? You don't, not everybody's entitled to, for you to be vulnerable with them at all times, just because, you know, they said, Hey, now's the time I'm going to say something that's going to trigger you and whatnot, or we don't always have to go deep with everybody. That's okay. So it's a protective mechanism. But again, that protection is there because there's a wound that we're, we want to cover. And we don't want to let somebody in to expose that wound and hurt me again. Yeah. But when you're fully healed and you're fully open, then it's OK to I, I can have empathy for you. And I'm not I'm not dealing with that myself. And so it's OK that I, I can hear your story and support you and offer whatever support that I can. Yeah. Well, is your bottle lighting up right now? It is. <laughs> it's a special bottle. Nice. Well, want to get a sponsor for that one? What kind of Tony oh, Stark to. technology Lark. is this? Lark. Lark. This is um. 
a UV cleaning bottle so that actually you can probably see it where so you it just push this itself? button, it, it cleans itself. That's actually dope. That's dope. So I was, my crystal light packets won't, won't work for that. No, I, I was no. going to say, though, I mean, last episode I felt like was my therapy session. So I want to jump on Caleb's therapy session. No, I just, I, so I, with, no, with that being said, do you, do you feel like you're guarded a little bit? I, well, up until now, I didn't think so. <laughs> I like, no, cause like, I just, cause I really, I, I have friends that suffer from a lot of things and they'll, they'll bring up, bring it, issues and situations to me. I'm just like, okay. Um, uh, like, I just, I, I feel like the, the, my canned responses, hey, I'm sorry that you're going through that. Uh, that sucks. But, you know, I just, I feel like I cannot, like, I, I, I would love to kind of like, in a sense hurt with them so that I can better like be a friend to them and better be a comfort to them. So are you, are you trying to figure out, I'm, I guess, so would you say you're more wanting to be able to understand them or were you more wanting so. to empathize with them? I think empathize both, honestly, just cause I just, I'm, I, when tragedy, like, like the shooting that happened um, mm. a couple of days, a couple of weeks ago, you know, I, I had a friend that was like deeply hurt by that and deeply yeah. moved by that. She wasn't, you know within like the radius but she she had been down yeah. there but not where you know the violence took place but you know she immediately was like i almost i could have been down there i wanted to go down to that yeah. area and she was you know like in the, she was very very sad about it and i'm just like oh boy that's terrible and I, like well and there's so, nothing there's nothing wrong with your position on that some people are more sensitive than others right you know my wife is a highly sensitive person she has deep empathy for people and and some would say she's probably an empath right she Mm -hmm. feels things more deeply than than most of us she can pick up on things where somebody might be hurting she can just you'll sit down in front of her and she'll be like yep today's the day they're gonna cry and she'll just draw it out of you it it, it's it's strange to us because we don't have those we or we haven't practiced that level of interaction with humans, but she's always been that way. But it's it's okay that you don't necessarily feel all of those things. Again, for sometimes that's that's appropriate. Mm. I have to be strong in the job that I do at certain times as a chaplain because I'm sitting with people going through very very difficult situations, yeah. and if I break down and cry with them every single time, then it's not really always useful and it's not serving the purpose that I'm there to serve. Yeah. So it depends on the role that you're playing. If there's somebody that needs you to cry with them as a friend, it's like, wow, this, this feels really good to like cry with you about this. Um, if it's somebody that you look up to and they're, they're a mentor, they're asking you for advice, it may not be appropriate to cry with them, but mm. you know, it's just understanding the the situation and understanding what your strengths and what you're um, capable of g- delivering at that time. Yeah, well, and I can, I mean, obviously completely different because, I mean, being a chaplain, um, in my experience, I, you know, I'm not a chaplain. I've worked in hospice and I've learned throughout the years because um, when I first got in there, mm-hmm. it was very much so. I remember I had a patient, he, I still, I'll still, i never forget him, but it was a 30, 33-year-old patient um, mm-hmm. and um, he didn't have that long to live. And so when it was the night that he passed, I was there um Cause we were sitting um, bedside at that time and I was there with the family and I wanted to cry so bad. Um, but that night I just stone cold face because I was like, I can't cry cause I have to be the strong one. Cause I'm the mm-hmm. one in hospice, which I realized mm-hmm. in my, in my it, really we can sometimes cry. And that is sometimes beneficial. Cause looking back, I'm like, they're probably just thinking like, I didn't care. Now I know that they, they knew I cared, mm-hmm. but um it is situational sometimes, you know, and you, depending on your different experiences. And what I would say to you a little bit is sometimes um, listening to someone mm-hmm. is showing empathy in my mind. Yeah. Um, because sometimes that's what they need. Mm-hmm. Um, and like he said, you know, if they're looking for advice, then maybe that's different. But if you're able to listen to someone, that can bring comfort in a situation too as well. Um, you may not understand it, but being able to – if they feel comfortable to talk and comfortable enough to come to you and talk you talk to you about it, mm-hmm. um, you being vulnerable enough to listen to that and being open with them and at least saying, you know, and Caleb, you're good at this. You'll be like, you know, Hey, I'm really sorry. What can I do for you? Yeah. But, uh, there's a, there's so many times I've seen you do that for people. And, and that personally for me, I feel like goes a long way. Now I, 
you know, I feel like you probably have a little, I keep on going uh, to you as the, uh, uh, you're the expert in the court, the authoritative figure, you're the expert in the courtroom on mortal. this. I am a mere mortal. <laughs> no, it was because I remember just like, I, I went to one, ep- one episode, one session of therapy. Like when I said like earlier, a couple of years ago, my dad moved back to Kansas city. Uh, he lived with me for a while. And I thought I had thought for the longest time that the way that I was brought up through my childhood, the way I was raised, um, I had thought that I had settled all of that and that I was great. Cause you know, like we talked about in the boy band on, on the last episode, like how we moved out to LA and like being, you know, not really having the decision, having the choice to be in that group. And the way that I was raised, I thought I had settled all that. Cause you know, I'm there. I don't know any other life. The band breaks up. And I'm like, and I'm a, I'm a, like a sophomore in high school. I'm 14, 15 years old. That is when I finally get to like, basically become who I am. Like, okay, now who am I? Who am I without my three other brothers or three other coworkers? Who am I without my dad lording or like, you know, forcing me a- along this path? And so I began to try new things in school. I began to like hang out with people and do things that like, I was just trying everything like, oh, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll join this club. I'll do this. I'll do this. And so I began to do that. And then I moved back to Kansas City. And then I go from seeing my dad every day to seeing him once or twice a year. And so in my in my in my mind, I thought our relationship was great, you know, because, you know, I had a couple of years of like freedom we like out from under his thumb and then I move away and then I go and see him and it's great. We talk, we catch up, we reminisce. And then I'm back on a plane, you know, the following week. And so this relationship in my mind, I'm like, I have a great relationship with my dad. This is great. He's best dad ever. And then he moves back in with me and I realize immediately his presence raises my stress. It raises my anxiety and I'm on edge the second he walks into a room Mm. Um, and I got really defensive and just really like immediately angry. Like, what do you want? What's going on? What am I doing wrong? Um, and I began, I began to just immediately like lash out and I was, just, I was short with him. I was harsh with him all the time. Every interaction was, it was never good. And my wife, uh, pulled me aside and she said, you are not yourself. You have not been yourself since your dad moved in. And I was like, yeah, something doesn't feel right. And she's like, I think, I think you need to go talk to somebody. And I was like, I don't need therapy. <laughs> so I, you know, you know, cause again, I thought, I, th- I thought for the longest time that I was good, but I, I noticed a, a significant change in my behavior and just my stress, everything like in my marriage started to suffer because of it, because, you know, my wife didn't enjoy the way I was talking to my dad. She didn't enjoy the way that I was talking to her father-in-law. Uh, and so I went, I had I went to one session with this lady um, and I explained to her what was going on. And she said, it, 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 it feels like your inner child hasn't moved on. Like your inner child is still stuck. And this adult version of you is trying to protect little Caleb. And that's, that's the anger. That's the, that's the lashing out. That's your adult self feeling like he has to protect the inner child that didn't get a chance to move on, that didn't get a chance to, you know, have his life. And I was like, that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. I never went back to this therapist. Because, well, that's what I was going to say. So why, why didn't I go back? Because I felt, so this therapist, nothing against her. I thought she was, she was very good. Um, she helped, she helped me realize that. And that really helped me because what she, yeah. the advice she gave me was to speak to my inner child and say, you're okay. You're safe. I've got you. Like I've got myself. Like you don't have to protect, you know? So it, it helped, you know, a little bit. I, I, I should have went back. But the reason why I didn't stay with her was because she was an older white woman. And I felt like because she was an older white woman, I felt like she could not understand the just the background that black children have in a black household. Mm-hmm. You know, just the way that children are raised in a black household is different from the way children are raised in a white household. I just, that's how I feel about it. Yeah. So she could not identify. So maybe if she would have been an older black woman or an older black male, her advice might have been different just because she under, she has that background, that understanding, that foundational knowledge of my upbringing, of how that would have looked like. So maybe her you know, 
her advice might have been different. So that's why I did not go back. Now, should I have probably, you know, found a well, different I'm not, therapist? I'm not harping, oh, absolutely. I'm not I should have because you're not going back. I was just curious. No, I, I wanted to. I should have, but um because it, it it helped the relationship a little bit. But honestly, talking to my brother Chris and talking to my brother David and me lamenting on the relationship and how I wish that I wished what it was. And Chris letting and Chris really just empathized with me and said, hey, the relationship that you want, your dad does not have the capacity to give that to you. You have to understand that that mentally he he has not worked on some things so that he can't he can't he can't be what I need him to be for me. And it helped me to have a little bit more grace. I'm not I'm 100 percent not all the way there. But it helped me to have a little bit more grace toward my father. But I have to continually remind myself that he has some things that he has not worked through yet. Yeah. And I definitely still have some things that I have not worked through yet, but it helps the relationship. And now I get to set healthy boundaries. Ooh, we should go into boundaries. But uh, (laughs) I get to set healthy boundaries with my dad so that the relationship, even though it can't be what I wish it could be, it can be something that we both have like a middle ground in. And so that, you know, no. And I think it's good that I, that's, I mean, that actually, what you said actually helped me a lot already. I was like, I said, back to, back to therapy. <laughs> no, that was Chris. That was a little Chris. Chris told me that. That's Chris awesome. gave me that advice. Well, and um, I do want to boundaries is a really good, really good thing to segue kind of Wasn't into. even on the notes folks. <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> because I'll tell you the truth last year. Um, resolutions you know i don't always set them but the word for I, i've the last few years i've been wanting to have a word for the next year coming mm-hmm. up sure and last year for me it was boundaries and i was so set on that but that quickly was like a resolution that dissipated and i never did set any healthy boundaries and so what is a good um i don't know can you talk on boundaries a little bit and just kind of say you know yeah i think um I think when we think about boundaries, we're we're quick to put them up because we're trying to say, this is what I don't want in my life, right? I don't want toxic people in my life. I don't want, um, you know, this type of person to be able to say whatever they want to say to me. So I'm going to set up a boundary. Um, boundaries are more so, th- th- those things are true, but I, I see them as more so of a protective mechanism to permit something. Some What do you actually want to cultivate in your life? We'll set up boundaries for a garden so that the garden can thrive and that so there can be a, a place where there's nourishment and there's things that we can draw from it to to help us. But if we go into thinking about boundaries as like everybody that I'm going to cut out, then what are you left with? And then there's no opportunity for growth, even mm. in those things. Um, but I think it is important to understand that one, if you're going to set up boundaries with somebody, you need to communicate that to them. You cannot yeah. just set up a boundary yeah. in your mind. With an <laughs> expectation and be like. Right. And then you set yourself up for disappointment and yeah. having that person. And more anger and frustration. Break through those boundaries. So you need to communicate and say, hey, this is what I'm comfortable with or this is what I'm OK with. And I would ask if you could respect that because I'm working on myself. This is more to do with me than it is pushing you out. This is so I can heal. This is so I can be a healthier human being. And so therefore I need to set up these boundaries Um, and and boundaries. I think they can seem scary at first when you bring them up, but then I think the other person will appreciate that. They'll be like, Oh wow. And then they'll probably reflect. Maybe I should. Well, if they, I I think, I think if they love you enough to, to, to listen and like respect the boundary, because they're, I, I think, I mean, the boundaries that I've tried to set up with my dad have been difficult to kind of keep in place. Uh, just be, I, he has a hard time understanding, or he has a hard time just like listening and like accepting that I'm trying to set a boundary, you know, like with music, you know, like with, with, with again, with the boy band, uh, I didn't have a choice and I didn't really enjoy that process. I didn't enjoy that time for the most part. Mm-hmm. And so, it because of that that i had to set up a boundary like i can't i cannot discuss or share my passion for music with my father and the reason is is because in my childhood 
that is where that was such a big part of my life. But it was also the biggest part where I felt really no encouragement from my father. I how I feel is I don't remember getting the compliments and encouragement and the good jobs from music. It was, hey, you need to work on this. This messed up. This was sloppy. You need to do better. There was a lot of criticism that I that I remember getting, but never any like encouragement. And because of that, that's why I can't take compliments to this day around music or anything that I'm really passionate about. Um, because I didn't get the encouragement when I wanted it and needed it most, my dad really wants to be a big part in that now. And it's so difficult for me to try to let him in that space yeah. because it terrifies me that he's going to have something negative to say. And I've shared that with him. And he was like, I just want to be an encouragement to you. And I was like, I understand what you want to do now. But the thought of you having an opinion about my music terrifies me. And because it still terrifies me, I can't let you into this space right now. I can't I can't have you be a part of it. So I really try not to let him like see me play drums. I, I, I try really hard not to let him see me sing music just because I don't I, I, I'm terrified of the reaction, even though he see he swears he, he only wants to be an encouragement. Yeah, I hear you. But. I'm not ready for that yet. I'm not yeah. ready. I'm not I'm not I'm not in the space to allow you. I don't want you to have an opinion on it at this time. Good or bad. I don't want you to have an opinion. And that's like but he had a hard time he or not had has a hard time accepting that. And so when he asked, "Hey, what's going on with your shows? What are you up to?" I'm like, "I can't tell you right now cuz mm. So that's how you feel, huh? <laughs> that's how I feel and he's not happy with it, but uh it's 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 not fun. To, yeah, to I, think of, I think he's I think he's not out of happy that. with it's not that. Fun, but but I also think he having conversation with him, he is incredibly proud and he wants to celebrate everything. Yeah. Yeah, that I know we're that. doing. And so he feels robbed of the opportunity to mm-hmm. celebrate you mm-hmm. when you don't let him in. And that's where he's coming from. So it again, it's a journey. It's you don't have to get there tomorrow and maybe one day you will. Maybe. want to share that with him but then there will come a day when it might be too late and you're going to be like dang i wish he could have I, I wish i could have allowed that in versus <laughs> taking it to the grave like he'll never see me play drums yeah and and i i process it differently like i just i just don't i don't do it with music i just don't yeah because that's a whole other subject for me but um I just realized I don't really love it that much and I'm not talented. It's not your passion. It's not my passion. And so I get it in our family, like singing or doing anything musical comes with an expectation of excellence and perfection. Yeah. Well, maybe not perfection, but like performance. You right? got to do it at the highest level. It's performance. It's not in, enjoy for enjoyment. And so I was like, well, if I don't enjoy it that much, then why am I performing it? Right. So um, I channel my energy in other things. But that's something that like anybody that grew up in a family that had expectations set on them is like, oh, whether it was sports, whether it was academics, whether it was um, acting and entertainment or whatnot. uh, We all go through that if we have parents that are artistic and creative. And in in a sense, they are trying to live out their dream through us. And so it comes off a little bit more um, with a sense of urgency and passion and perfection is like, you got to do this. So, yeah, you know, yeah. I probably still need therapy. I Which, need. I definitely need to go back. Probably for sure. I need to go back. And, okay. Goodness. So real quick, I have. I'm gonna be a little vulnerable for a second. Sure. So just gonna kind of ask a little bit of advice. So what are you laughing about? I was gonna make a joke, but I, that's why. Well, I need what's your joke? I'm gonna make a joke now. Nothing. I got nothing. Go on. It's, it's, <laughs> see, I'm deflecting because I need therapy. And I need to get my brain mapped. But no, go ahead. Do your thing. This um, is a serious moment. No. So like with my. My bio- Caleb knows a little. Well, mm. Caleb knows a lot. My biological <laughs> father. Um, so um, he left. My parents divorced when I was six. I didn't see him for, you know, years mm. after that. And we, the times I did see him was very scattered. Um, and there is some substance abuse history in the, that whole family. Um, but I, now as an adult, and it just kind of come up with your, your guys' kind of interaction kind of made me want to ask you a little bit. I've forgiven him a long time ago, which I realized even lately, like, have I truly forgiven, you know? Um, But a part of me has accepted the fact that I may never get that closure, Mm -hmm. but a part of me scared of never getting that closure. Mm. 
And a part, but part of it is for me not being afraid, not, not afraid to have that conversation, you know, like, cause there's things I want to say, there's things I want to know, you know, just from that. And I, I think I, you kind of probably said it's just, you know, like initiating that conversation, having mm-hmm. that. And especially because you, I now know losing two people in my life, like life's short time is, yeah. you know, and if you want something, you, you, you're not, they're not going to be here forever. And so, right. you, you know, you're going to have to go after that. Part of the reason we don't want to have those conversations is because we want to be able to hold on to what we're holding on to. For the hope. Well, it, it's, I, I have this thing against you. And if I, and if I tell you, and if it goes well, and you're like, I'm so sorry, then then I don't get to hold that anymore. I have to actually let it go because you've now attempted to like the, the reconciliation part. So now it's on me and it's fully on me to let that go. Mm. So we sometimes like to hold that over people, hold them in our resentment, hold them in our frustration and keep them there. But it's only hurting you. Yeah. Um, it's like drinking poison and expecting somebody else to die. It's like, how much is it affecting them versus how much is it affecting you? And so I just remind people of that. It's, hey, um, this is not helping you at all in any bit. And it's definitely it may or may not be hurting them. You don't know. Yeah. And that conversation, um, again, as long as you've said, I've, I'm going to approach this with the intention to release it versus like, I got something to tell you and get it off my chest and you right. never da 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 da. No, that's, that's the wrong energy also. Oh, that's how I want to go at it. <laughs> you got to approach it with the mic, the right, you know, the initiate, the, um, what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I, I would say posture is, is everything in in those conversations. Like, what are you trying to accomplish? And for some people who have been deeply, deeply hurt, whether it's through um, a sexual abuse or physical abuse or whatnot, I think they're very brave that they do want to have those conversations. But I would advise against it if that person is still like using or they're still in that situation or scenario, then it's probably not safe for you to talk to that person. Yeah. If you feel like this other person, your dad, for example, is is being safe and he's, you know, has his cognitive abilities about him and he's for the most part mentally healthy, then I think that's OK. I think for our dad, it's difficult because I know the mental challenges that he's dealing with. Yeah. He doesn't really have the like, again, capacity or empathy side of him to really say, I hear what you're saying or or process it because his brain is moving so much faster than he's like already like thinking about what he's going to say in response. Gotcha. So it's very difficult for him to just sit with you and just grieve any sort of loss. Yeah. Um, I learned that the hard way when I sat with him and tried to tell him something hard. And he was just like, well, you see the Bible says that. And I was just like, that's not what I need right now. But yeah. now understanding his level of um, ability to engage on that level was, was not something that I was going to get. And so I had to be okay with that. But yeah. it made me feel better to go through the process so that now I know. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just, I just had to ask. I was curious. So that, thank you. So, and I want to thank you for coming out um, all the way from California just to be on the show. <laughs> yeah, no, you I came know. just to be, <laughs> yeah, you came out just to be on the show. Um, yeah. Well, no, I think we definitely would love to have you back sometime. And well, you know, let's, let's we can talk. You've about already been fired. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, but I mean, definitely down the road, you know, I think there's a lot more topics um, just, you know, some things we've touched on that we can mm-hmm. touch on even more. And yeah, um, I think it's some. It, I, I do want to put this out there. If, if you are somebody who's like struggling in your mental health and you, you need some help, you're thinking about suicide, you're thinking about harming others, like, please reach out. You can reach out to me if you're listening to this, you know, they can, you can put my contact information yeah, in, the, in the description. But um, it's so important that people feel that they're not alone in their struggle. And a lot of the times we tell the best stories to ourselves, right? So the story I'm telling myself is like, nobody cares about me. Nobody can understand what I'm going through. And we use that as an excuse to keep like digging ourselves into this deeper hole. Mm. It's like, cause it just feels better to yeah. be alone in our suffering. I'm somebody that would isolate as a kid, right? If I was going through something difficult, I would go to my room and I would just cry by myself or like, I didn't want to be around anybody. I go climb a tree, you know, I would yeah. just want to be all alone. And that just what helped soothe me. But now that I'm married, I don't get to do that. I don't get to just, have a loan time. You know, <laughs> a loan. You, yeah. You know, I, I can, yeah. you know, when it's appropriate, 
But I live with someone who wants to understand and wants to know what I'm going through. Sure, and, yeah. and I owe that to her too. Yeah. And, and, but if you're alone in your marriage, if you're alone in your family, if you feel completely alone, then like reach out to somebody. Yeah. Don't continue to isolate yourself even when you're around people. Cause that's the worst feeling. Like, gosh, nobody actually cares. Nobody asked me how I'm doing today. And, yeah. uh, and you'll just keep telling yourself that story without actually reaching out and getting help. So I would say make that step, reach out to somebody, a friend, a pastor, a chaplain, you know, somebody you respect anybody. Yeah. No. And we'll definitely, we're going to tag your, your business. Um, so people can go to your page and learn huh. more about, you know, um, who you are and what, you know, what got you to this point. Um, so thank you for being on the show. Come yeah, out, uh, out drop those. your socials real quick. Tag them. We've never done so before, but yeah. <laughs> Where, yeah, where, so where can people find you at, Chris? In the description below. No, but also say it out loud. Where can people find you at, Chris? Um, you can find me at Wellness District LA there you on go. Instagram and at Chris D. Foreman on Instagram as well. It's right. my personal All page. Right. You guys, uh, yeah, go check them out. Talk to them, especially if, you, if you're going through anything. Let them know. Hey, Let if you know. ever branch out, you know, you could always start Wellness District KC. KC? You know, he's, he he's, would... he's actually like, it's not, he's... He's actually trying to do it. Listen, I'm here for it. Um, so <laughs> let's go. Um, weekly segment. What you got this time? Man, do we really want to do one after this heavy episode? <sighs> Just go with you it. You got to stay right. consistent. Here's the thing. I so this is this is now this is kind of only kind of like a slant, a slant to my mom because she's the only person that does it right now. <laughs> but no, but um, people call my phone. Like sometimes when, when somebody calls your phone. And you can tell they are, they're only calling you because they want something, but they'll shoot the breeze with you for a little bit. Hey, what's going on? Are you busy right now? I'm like, what do you want? Oh, I just wanted to see how you was doing. Are you bu- <laughs> what you doing right now? Nothing. What do you want? You ain't doing nothing right now? Nah. Well, I was wondering, can you help me? I'm like, no, nah, no. Nah. See, that makes my mom does feel. it a little bit of a lot. <laughs> But like she hasn't called me in a while. But like I got I used to have some friends that would do it all the time when they call your phone. I'm like, hey, what you doing right now? Why? What you doing right now? Why you want to know what I'm doing right now? I just want to see what you up to what you what you up to. I'm not ever doing do that. Yeah, can you give me a ride somewhere? Oh man, no, I'm not doing it. But you said <laughs> you weren't doing nothing. <laughs> that makes me so mad. Hey, you were an Uber driver. So I was being paid. You got to give a discount to your I friends. I was for work. Nah, I just, I, that, that makes me mad when people do that to me. Cause I, like, usually it, it stems from like when I used to, when I used to live in LA, when people would call your phone, um, no one ever said, and my, when I remember is no one ever said hello. It was always when they answered the phone, what happened? Oh. Like it was just, that was how it, everybody that I was friends with, anybody that I talked to, when you answer the phone, what happened? And that's how I started to answer the phone. It was like, what happened? And they're like, nothing. They're just calling to see what's up. Why? What happened? <laughs> like, it was just, like, I always get anxiety when I, when I pick up the phone. So, yeah, that's my rant. I don't like right. people call me and that's ask how me you for feel. I Don't you. call me and ask you for favors. Have, I, have mm-hmm. I done that? No. But, like, if you call me, you need a favor. Just say the favor. Don't, hey. Don't beat around the bush. Are you doing good? How, how's, your, how's your mom and that? Like, stop it. Just get to the ask. So that's my I, rant. I got you. I'm not going to rant this week. Boy, you going to leave me out here like this? Okay. I am. That's I, fine. Be, <laughs> because I think we owe it to give props and praises to our producer. <laughs> yeah. Truly, like when we started this project, you came up with this idea and you're like, hey, Levi, you want to do this podcast? And I was like, yeah, I've always wanted to do a podcast. Like, yeah. Um, and my wife is incredibly talented. And she amazes me more and more each day. And going through this journey, just watching her excitement and the dedication to it and the editing and just all the audio setup, like the lights. Like, hey, truly, Julia, would you would you like edit like a picture of yourself into this shot while he talks about you real quick? Ah, man. I'll work, we'll work on it. But okay, I just cool. I really truly wanted to give props. Props to Julia. Uh, yeah, for, big shout out to Julia for everything, and props to Chris for coming out and hanging oh, out. Thank with you us. again for uh, coming props on my to podcast you guys for you, being vulnerable and creating yeah. a space for people to feel heard and seen. Yeah, yeah, man. I mean, I do. You have any rants or praises? You don't have to. I just again, I'm not really the rant type of person. <laughs> so Caleb got I, that gene. <laughs> he definitely got that gene. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, well, on, the, on a rare occasion, my wife will will get. A rant from me, but it's from something like really small or funny. Yeah, and 
<laughs> and then I let, I really do let it go. I don't remember. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I would say then, then a moment of gratitude would be for, um, let me think. I, I, I will say I'm grateful for our dad. We, we did talk about him a lot. Um, again, I'm, I'm grateful for the things that he did provide for us because although he wasn't, you know, nobody's perfect. No parent is. And yeah. I always compare myself to like people on a spectrum, like they, they didn't have a dad or this person, like, you know, had multiple, you know, right. <laughs> wives and siblings and people you don't even know about. And I'm like, yeah, he was hard on us and he was strict. But yeah, those those things and those memories that we created as a family and as as brothers, although they were they were tough, it's like they made us who we are. And yeah. Like I'm so grateful that we're all, you know, doing well, starting our own businesses and podcasts, using that creativity, putting that energy out there for for good things. And um, you know, we're not in jail. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I'd be mad when I when I, be, when I be looking back at like the things that I've done and like the talents that I have, and I'm like, ah, my daddy gave me that. I'd be so mad yeah. about it. Yeah, he did. Now, you should he be did. glad about it. Uh, yeah, well. Because yeah. you wouldn't be, what, like you like you said, you wouldn't be would who not. you are today. You can speak it. English. <laughs> you have all four <laughs> of your limbs. I mean, I mean, I just think about like the privileges yeah. that we have and like we get to sit here and, and break down some of the things of our childhood and our past because we're afforded that opportunity given us by our parents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Shout, no. out, shout, shout out to parents. Shout out to my pops. No, that's awesome. I and my mother. I love you too, mom. <laughs> So I think that's it for this episode. Um, yeah. Thanks for tuning in, folks. Thank you for joining with us. If you're still with us, thank you so much. Remember to like, comment, subscribe. Check all, out all Chris's ways. information below. Yeah. Check out Chris's information below. Uh, if you have any questions for him, please send them to him, not us. Mm -hmm. uh, we will see you next week on another episode of That's How You Feel. And don't forget to tag Adele. Tag Adele. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>